Long-term care facilities have been hit the hardest during the COVID-19 pandemic, with more than half the deaths coming from those facilities. I spoke with Massachusetts State Senator Joe Comerford, the chair of the Joint Committee on Public Health, to find out more about increased funding and measures to keep families informed. Elders uh, have been among the community's hardest hit by COVID-19, again, uh, here in the Commonwealth and across the nation which is why I'm really in support of and helped push uh, two initiatives, one at the command center or administration level, and one via legislation that the Senate just moved on data collection. Can you talk a little bit about that as far as the data collection goes? The data bill, uh, as we call it in the Senate, is quite comprehensive. It's really a triple win, actually, when we look at it. Uh, and I'm really grateful to the many colleagues who were part of this. It did kick off as part of the Senate's working group process and now actually is calling for both transparency, which is essential in a healthy democracy, reporting, public reporting and accessible reporting, and then accountability, meaning that not only are we going to make the data available and talk about it and publish it publicly, but we're also going to ask the administration to articulate plans to address the disparities that are going to be clearly evident in the data. And with regard to elders, there's a host of data being collected from long-term care facilities now that will help us understand the situation currently uh, and in, in going into the past, and then also help us target resources going forward. Can you talk a little bit um, about that transparency and the data? Are you talking about specifically um, having information from you know, particular nursing homes? I know the soldier's home is one that has been widely reported, but when you're looking at the breakdown of other nursing homes in a particular area, it's not as easy to find as you had mentioned. Absolutely, that's been part of the problem. Uh, is that you know there, we needed a data warehouse, if you will, a collection hub to be able to look and, and actually target our looking at specific facilities. Actually attendant to this is what just passed through executive order, which is a phase two look at nursing homes and another infusion of resources. So Secretary Sutters announced even before the data bill was passed in the Senate, that the state would put in or infuse another $130 million into long-term care facilities. That's a total of $260 million additional state dollars. And along with that was a targeted 28-point checklist, which will also be public. So not only will we collect the information and families with loved ones in these long-term care facilities have access to that information, the Department of Public Health and the command center, so the administration, the Baker administration, will make public the results of these 28-point audits that are going to be ongoing and actually tied to funds coming into facilities. I want to pick up on what you just said, but I also want to go back uh, to numbers and reporting. But um, let's go back to numbers and reporting first. We had talked about the soldiers' home in Holyoke, uh, also in Chelsea. Um, Boston Media is reporting um, some other you know, nursing homes that have had some significant problems. Uh, Boston 25 um, reported on a nursing home in Lawrence that had more than 40 um, residents who died of COVID-19. Um, uh, Boston 25 and CVB also reported on a nursing home in Medford that had more than 50 residents who died. Um, you know, what's your message to people who are concerned, uh, you know, in this crisis about their loved ones? It's wrenching. This is a wrenching time. And I guess my message is it's, it was imperative that the state step up and put more money into this sector. This sector needed our attention, needed our focus, needed state money. Uh, and resources before COVID-19. And it became almost immediately clear that it needed the kind of intensive focus that, that's embodied in both the latest executive order uh, and this data bill, if you will. Uh, so both are necessary going forward. And what we've seen uncovered here in co as part of the COVID-19 pandemic, in terms of inequities, in terms of uh, vulnerabilities, in terms of real, um, real hardships visited upon communities uh, needs to be addressed as we build back from COVID-19. Um, and it also needs to be addressed 
in the in the very immediate term through actions like this. And so when you talk about those numbers, uh, you have uh, more than 3,000 deaths from long-term care facilities, 60 percent about, you know, on any, any given day of the deaths in Massachusetts. Uh, the average age is 82. Um, how do you proceed forward, as, as you say, as, as we come out of this, as we're already starting to talk about, you know, phase one of reopening, what is this going to look like in September uh, if, if we have another flare-up? Yeah, I mean, I, that's, that's really what everybody's talking about now, right? So COVID-19, not only in long-term care facilities, but certainly um, they are top of the list or one of the tops of the list of inequities that were exposed. Uh, communities of color, poor communities, all of these fissures that we long knew were present in the Commonwealth just grew wider and wider and more painful and acute and needed this kind of immediate action. So you'll see in the data bill, and it has to get reconciled with one that passed the House, but we're also looking for data around race and class in that data bill in a community um, so that we can, again, tell this larger picture of inequity uh, or larger story of inequity and then begin to address it, right? Because there's that accountability measure. Um, so we have to continue the immediate work of getting resources um, in the form of people, in the form of money, in the form of information, in the form of, you know, boots on the ground. As, for example, with the nursing homes where the National Guard has been deployed. We have to continue doing that right now. And at the same time, as part of the reopening conversation, we have to have the plans uh, begin to be laid so that we won't have these same kind of tragedies should the Commonwealth experience another flare up uh, of COVID-19 or another uh, like pandemic. You talked about, you know, there were some uh, vulnerabil vulnerability, I should say, uh, prior to the COVID-19 um, outbreak. Uh, do you think more focus should have been on those facilities from the get-go? Sure. Yeah, we should have been looking at all places where we knew there were inequities going into COVID-19. You know, I, 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 hindsight is always incredibly powerful as you know, and I think everybody would say now, knowing what we've seen, uh, that all of these places from, again, from all, from all of the places that we've seen experience the greatest hardships, um, we should have understood that nursing homes uh, that have long had a vulnerability with regard to adequate staffing, for example, or adequate reimbursement rates uh, from the government, uh, you know, we and now we couple with that the fact that elders um, are particularly vulnerable to COVID-19. You know, we uh, should have and could have uh, had a quicker and sharper focus and infusion of resources into these facilities at the beginning of this pandemic. Um, I, again, I, I believe what, what the secretary has done with this phase one and phase two has been critical. I, I know there's going to be a phase three uh, because we cannot let up on the kind of intensive focus uh, that we need to have as a state on these facilities for their, their residents, for their staff, and for the families of, of everyone involved. Um, and I know uh, that all of the elder advocates Commonwealth wide are saying this is just the beginning of what we uh, must do going forward to ensure greater safety and greater well-being. And you talked a little bit about the staff, of course, they're frontline uh, workers uh, caring, you know, for uh, the residents there. How do you encourage them as they move through this? You know, many of them um, have become sick in the midst of this as well. Absolutely. That's why I included them, right? It is about the residents, it's about the staff, and it's about the families of both the residents and the staff. Uh, you know, that they are three cohorts and they are uh, all critical. The essential workforce in all of these frontline positions of care, you know, whether it's the nursing homes or hospitals or, or in the food service sector, have really been putting their lives on the line for the entirety of COVID-19. And they've been doing it in absolutely tumultuous waters where what we understand about the virus has been changing, where we haven't had enough resources so that they, for a long time and even still today, don't have adequate personal protective equipment, although that's changing a little bit, not quickly enough, um, where testing hasn't been adequate, 
uh, to be able to uh, cycle them back into work without fear. All of these things have been intensely painful uh, and you know, all have had to be de dealt directly in terms of service individually by the people who have been serving on the front lines. That's the context in which they've continued to work in facilities like long-term care facilities.